right, so the purpose of this session is to basically allow you to see a few of the new U01 that we have awarded. Um, this was another re uh, response to your feedback in that you want to hear about the new U01s. Um, given that we are backlogged in presenting these, um, some of these are not that new. They may be a year, maybe a year and a half, two years old. But um, so these are new U01s that you haven't heard about. And the purpose of this is for them to present um, in general, what their project is about and refer you to their poster. So it's sort of like a lightning presentation, but um, about 10 minutes each. So we'll start out first um, from the group led by Walter Boron, Eriki Samer Saltlo, and Imad Takahorshid. And the presenter will be uh, Rosanna Achipinti, Acupinti, sorry. So uh, please welcome Rosanna. So um, today I will give a brief, over, brief overview oh, sorry. Okay. of this project on behalf of the TPI. So this project involves two uh, institutions, Case Western Reserve University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And this project is on multi -scale, developing a multi-scale model of gas transport to channels in living cells. So before going into the, giving you a, a general overview of the project, I would like to uh, emphasize why it is important to study the transport of gases across biological membranes. As we all know, the transport of gases across biological membranes is one of the most fundamental processes in life. As we all know, the movement of oxygen, for example, through, plasma, through the many membranes in our body is important for oxidative metabolism. The movement of CO2 through um, membranes is important for acid-base balance. Uh, ammonia for waste disposal and, for example, nitride oxide for signaling. So, as you can see, basically, the movement of gases across biological membranes play a central role in both health and pathological state. So, what has been the dogma so far? The dogma has been that all gases move to all biological membranes simply by dissolving in and diffusing through the lipid phase of the membrane. Basically, the plasma membrane doesn't provide and offer any resistance to the movement of gases. This is a classical Overton rule. However, we have evidence for gas transport to channel. The first um, challenge to the dogma was, uh, um, the, the, the traditional dogma was the challenge in 1994 with the discovery of the first gas impermeable membrane, the apical membrane of the gastric gland. Later, the, first, the Boron lab provided the first evidence for a gas carbon dioxide to pass through uh, membrane channels. And this uh, membrane channel was identified as the water channel equaporin one. Now we know many other families of gas channels which have different permeabilities and can have different selectivity to different gases. These other channels in addition to aquaporins are the RH proteins and the urea transporters. So what is the main goal, the overarching goal of this project? The goal is to develop a multi-scale mathematical model that can describe quantitatively the movement of gases across biological membrane, and this movement can occur via the lipid phase of the membrane or through the so-called gas channels, so these uh, membrane-embedded proteins. In, uh, and then the goal is also to develop a graphical user interface and make the model uh, able to predict, make prediction on gas movement across biological membrane and also make prediction on its consequence in a variety of physiological and biological settings. So what is our approach? We, definitely, we use a multidisciplinary approach which combines molecular biophysics and in particular molecular dynamic simulation with mathematical modeling and with experimentalists, in particular with cellular physiology and uh, in particular electrophysiology and mutagenesis. So, uh, since the project is heavily based on the, on the physiological experiments, so what are, what are the physiological experiments that we are trying to model and through which we are trying to get our information on the gas permeability uh, through plasma membrane? So, our main, um, so our experimental model system is uh, the Xenopus oocyte frog, so frog oocytes, so spherical cell, which are very uh, which are very good model system um, to uh, study physiologically how membrane, ch membrane uh, channels and transporters um, behave when expressed in, expressed in this system. 
So, and uh, also we take advantage of, um, we study those gases which basically um, change pH um, when they move across biological membrane, so when they move across the plasma membrane of the oocyte, and then we take advantage of these pH changes to, um, uh, to measure them with pH-sensitive microelectrodes. So what are the main changes caused in, when, uh, by CO2 influx when you expose a cell like any cell to equilibrated CO2 and bicarbonate? So as a cell is exposed to CO2 and bicarbonate, CO2 will enter the cell, will combine with water to make proton and bicarbonate. So the intracellular concentration of proton will, will increase and therefore the PHI will decrease. So, and this can be measured um, experimental, uh, experimentally with a PHI microelectrode, and this is a typical recording that we obtain, that we obtain with uh, um, a PHI microelectrode. So what happens at the outer surface of the cell, which is the main signal, the main pH, um, physiological data to which we are interested in our uh, experiment? Uh, so at the extracellular side of the, um, of, the, uh, of the membrane, the carbon dioxide concentration will uh, decrease. So the CO2 bicarbonate equilibrium is gets perturbed, and the CO2 can be replenished by two processes. One is diffusion from the bulk, and this process does not involve any, um, any change in pH, in proton concentration, so we cannot detect this type of measurement, or uh, this type of process. However, the second process, which is the reaction of bicarbonate, with proton to make CO2 in water involves a change in proton concentration. So actually it involves a consumption of proton. So in this case, we, we can detect a rise in surface pH and with a surface pH microelectrode, and this is a typical recording that we obtain. So this is what we see for a control oocyte. However, when we express aquaporin-1, we see that the transient in surface pH gets bigger because of a faster rate of, uh, influx in, of CO2 influx through the plasma membrane. So the delta PHS, so the difference between the height of these two spikes, is our uh, channel-dependent CO2 permeability, the, change, the delta pH change due to the um, enhanced CO2 per, uh, influx by aquaporin-1. So in this um, piece of information is, so the height of the surface pH spike is the same quantitative index of membrane permeability to CO2. So the surface pH transient, is the, which we measure with a surface pH microelectrode, is the key physiological data that we are interested in. However, we don't know how to link this information, this data, with macroscopic membrane permeability for CO2. So our goal is to develop a multi-scale model that will allow us to, com to connect the physiological data with macroscopic membrane permeability of CO2 and also for ammonia. In this case, I'm focusing only on CO2. So how do we do our multi-scale analysis of gas transport across biological membrane? So we have a multi-scale component, so we span different spatial scale and also time scale. So we go from a macroscopic scale, atomistic scale, to mesoscopic scale, to submacroscopic scale, and finally to microscopic cellular, the entire cell, the entire oocyte cell. And also we have several um, time scales, which go from nanoseconds in the, in the case of microscopic molecular dynamic simulations to uh, several hundred seconds in the case of the entire pH uh, transient. So what are the main aims for this project? The first aim is on uh, um, using molecular dynamic simulations to characterize the permeation pathway of CO2 and also predict single channel per membrane permeability to CO2 for two main um, um, proteins, which are AQP1 and AQP5, for which we know the crystal structure. And then we also want to study the role of mutation on this uh, single channel membrane permeability and also of chemical modification and metal binding. So the molecular dynamic simulation will provide us with a single channel membrane permeability that we will use in the second uh, aim to inform our mesoscopic uh, model of uh, a single um, aquaporin tetramer embedded in a lipid, me uh, layer, uh, lipid membrane or uh, a mitoscopic model of uh, um, many tetramers randomly distributed in a patch of a membrane. So the membrane is no longer assumed to be homogeneous. homogeneous. And then we will also use uh, the mitoscopic model to inform our submacroscopic model of the spatial environment which is created by the surface pH electrode when it's pushed gently against the oocyte cell membrane. And then we will also integrate all of this modeling 
into our microscopic model of all cells, uh, the entire cell uh, that we use in our experiment. And these are all reaction diffusion models. So finally, the third aim will be on the experiments that will help inform and also validate our, our uh, mathematical modeling. So there is a strong synergistic um, interaction between modeling and experiment and physiology. So basically, we, uh, we will perform intracellular pH measurement and also surface pH measurement uh, on all sites expressing aquaporin 1 or aquaporin 5 using, uh, for example, in order to perform, um, to inform the submicroscopic level that I'm indicating in C, we will perform experiments with the surface pH electrode which have different diameter, tip diameter, different distance uh, from the plasma membrane, and we will see how the signal get affected, and then we will inform our um, mathematical model. And then we will also use, uh, we will do per, uh, experiments by using also mutations and inhibitors of AQP1 and AQP5. These experiments will be of fundamental importance for informing and testing this, the molecular dynamic simulation in the M1. And there will be a continuing interaction and uh, communication with all, all this modeling and the experiments going back and forth. So, and this is all. And uh, if you want to have additional information regarding this project, we uh, have a poster. And uh, I would like to thank, of course, NIH and the National Institute of General Medicine for funding the project and also all the um, multi-scale modeling group at IMAC, and uh, these are our contact information. Thank you. Um, next up will be Dr. Colleen Clancy and her project. Yeah. So thanks, Grace, for the opportunity to present um, some of the work that uh, stems from our UL1 project, predictive multi-scale pharmacology from atom to rhythm. So, um, so sort of the overarching goal of um, the work that I'll tell you about today is to develop a computational methodology for multi-scale process that will allow us to screen drugs, both you know, for preclinical drug screening and also in the presence of disease, to determine mechanisms of drug success or failure, and to predict therapy in the setting of use the mouse. Okay. And to predict therapy in the setting of uh, disease states. And so the reason that we want to be able to do this is because at present there's actually no way to know how a drug that may have complicated interactions with its target, in our case we're interested in, in cardiac ion channels, will actually alter electrical behavior over many scales of the system to disrupt electrical activity in the whole heart. And so what we're trying to do is to bridge that gap by developing a model that spans many space and time scales that will allow for the first time a way to predict how a, a drug from the atomic scale will affect the rhythm in the whole heart. So in order to be able to do this, we've brought together a pretty big team, an expert team, which brings together modelers at the level of the protein structure and it, all the way up through molecular dynamics, protein function, um, uh, dynamical systems theory, whole organ, and ultimately workflow development with Andrew McCulloch's lab, and I think you heard a little bit about that earlier today. And then we have a whole other team, which is this complementary experimental team, which is so critical to both provide us data to inform the models as we build them, and also to test predictions of the model in order to validate them. So today I'm just going to focus on two of the targets that we've been interested in. One is the cardiac sodium channel, NAV 1.5, and the other is the herd potassium channel. And I should say that one of the critical reasons that we're interested in doing this is because the lack of ability to predict how a drug will alter electrical activity in the whole heart is a, a primary reason why drugs were removed from the market following FDA approval, and it's also a major hindrance to drug discovery at the pharma level. 
And we're now just starting to um, work on calcium channels as well after publication of a new structure of the mammalian voltage gated calcium channels. So I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview. And the work at the atomic scale has been performed largely by Vladimir Yarovyarovoy, who's at UC Davis, a new faculty member, Igor Vrobrov, and a student in the group, Kevin DeMarco, who had a poster today that you may have visited. And so what we started to do is to build homology models using the Rosetta software suite and to build models of ion channels in distinct conformational states. So this sh shows a closed NAV 1.5 channel based a homology model based on NADRH and an open model based on the structure of NADMS. Now, more recently, and this has kind of been an ongoing issue for us, is we get the models and we're ready to go. We're running our molecular dynamics, and then a publication comes out with a new and better model. And so that's happened with the voltage-gated mammalian calcium channel, and more recently, the cockroach uh, voltage-gated sodium channel structure has been published. So a little bit back to the drawing board. It's a feedback loop, but we're getting more efficient at it all the time. And the other thing that we're benefiting from is other structures that have been solved, including an NMR structure that exists for the 3,4 linker, which is the, um, the canonical uh, fast inactivation peptide for the voltage-gated sodium channel. And so Kevin has actually built a model of that and has begun to dock that linker into the open state of the sodium channel. And that's a really exciting thing for us because it will allow us to get at questions like, you know, what is the fundamental mechanism of late sodium channel block? And that's a big question in the cardiac field. And our hypothesis is that it stabilizes the inactivation loop. By using this approach, we can actually start to uh, try to answer some of those questions. We've collaborated with Toby Allen, who's also part of this project. He's in Australia. And last summer, Kevin and I went there so that we could uh, brush up on our molecular dynamics techniques. And, and I would argue that Toby is really the world expert in this regard in the case of sodium channels. And so by working with Toby and other collaborators, what we've been able to do is to develop a process whereby we can use a potential mean force calculation that allows us to get at the free energy of binding of drugs to various conformational states of the channel and in different binding poses. And so just to you know, draw your attention to one example, this sort of deep energy well here, which is a low free energy score, indicates you know, loosely translates to high affinity binding for a drug to the open and activated state of the channel. And interestingly, that free energy relates to the KD of the drug. So using that information and then running some molecular dynamics to get at, um, I'll, I'll go back to that slide, to get at the diffusion coefficients of these, we can start to constrain the K on and K off rates of drug interactions with conformational states of the channel. Um, and this is shown for a potassium channel here. And so now we're at the function scale of the drug where this Markov chain model represents the conformation of various conformational states of a potassium channel, and that can be drug-free, it can be bound to neutral drug, or it can be bound to charged drug. And then we use additional experimental data to constrain those um, models. And I'll just go back to this, because I, I really want to make the point here that, you know, this is really a team effort, and we're working with a lot of different people to try to put all these pieces together. And these are the folks that are really in the lab every day doing the work, and some of them are, you'll see here. So once we sort of have this function scale model where we can look at how drug interaction affects the gating of the channel in time, we can take that model and introduce it into a complex model of the cardiac cell that includes all of the sort of transmembrane processes for ion transport, and even includes intracellular calcium induced calcium release and buffering of calcium by various uh, known buffers. And then what we can do is start to predict how the drug will affect cellular level electrophysiological parameters. And this is shown in a large population of cells, so we build sort of a sensitivity analysis into the front end of the model by vi randomly varying parameters within the standard deviation of the uh, data. And what you can see here is, is we're tracking parameters. How much does the drug affect triangulation of the action potential, uh, uh, instability of the action potential, dispersion of repolarization, reverse rate dependence, and even spatial uh, dispersion of repolarization. So this is actually a computed electrogram from tissue comprised of these cells. And um, we can take all of these parameters that we're tracking together that are known to, in to be indicate propensity to arrhythmia, and we're in the process of developing a scoring system that correlates um, a weighted average of these 
parameters to the persistence of a reentrant wave, which is indicative of a cardiac arrhythmia. So this is showing just a snapshot of a simulation in two dimensions, where now what we've done is to use a rebuilt simulated tissue, and we're trying our best to induce an arrhythmia in the simulated tissue. We're, we're finding the, the conditions. So you can think of this as sort of like an in silico diagnostic, where in the control setting, we actually cannot identify conditions that will allow us to induce a reentrant arrhythmia. But in the case of a drug, we can find those conditions, and then we can track how easy is it to induce that arrhythmia, and how long does it last? And you can see it lasts considerably longer than the drug-free phase. And then a really important thing for us to be able to do is after we make all of these predictions, is to have some validation data. And what we've tried to use in our preliminary test set of drugs is really the gold standard, which is clinical data. And so what you can see here, this is purely a prediction. This is not model fit to this data. It's a prediction of the model that's compared to data. And some of these data are published uh, recently from the FDA, and others are a little bit older. And so we can look at the concentration dependence of the QT interval, how it varies as a function of rate, and even the relationship between QT interval and the preceding RR interval. And what you can see is, at least for this drug, the simulation data falls squarely within the uh, clinical data. So one of the things that we're really always worried about as model developers is how to ensure reproducibility, reliability, and scalability. I mean, it's great if we can build this pipeline and we can bring together 30 people and they can hack on it for a year, but it's not really useful to do that. So what we'd like to be able to do is to build that prototype and then scale it so that you can put any drug into the front end, just take the chemistry, pop it in, parameterize the drug, and move all the way up and predict the effect on the rhythm. And so we've been working with the National Biomedical Computation Resource, and this year we've been very lucky because the resource has picked up this project as one of their driving biomedical projects, which has allowed us to work really closely with that group to develop workflows which optimize both the software and make reproducible software and also figure out what's the optimal hardware for each of these processes to run on. And just as a, a quick aside, you know, there's also been activity in other collaborative arenas of the MSM consortium, and I'll just show you two papers that came out recently with a whole group of us that got together and wrote some reviews of current going, current going on. And then finally, just really important to acknowledge sort of all the foundational work that led into this U01 project and other support that allows us to really build this larger group and, um, and continue, and all of the collaborators that have been so critical to getting this project going, and we think we're almost there. So thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, next up is Dr. Jeffrey Holmes and his project. Jeff Holmes, I'm the overall PI of the project. Collaborators at the University of Virginia are Ken Vilchik in cardiology and Shane Pierce in DME. And then uh, at UC San Diego, it's Jeff Omens and uh, Andrew McCulloch. So the clinical problem we're interested in is heart failure. There are over 5 million uh, Americans currently diagnosed with heart failure and uh, 500,000 new cases each year, 300,000 deaths each year. Um, and we're focusing on a particular treatment called cardiac resynchronization therapy that I'll say a little bit about in a couple of slides. Um, there are several drugs that we have for heart failure um, that can slow the progression, but what's really unique about CRT is that um, when it works, it can actually reverse heart failure, dramatically improving function, shrinking the size of a dilated heart. Um, however, the reason we think there's an important role for modeling here is that the response to CRT from patient to patient varies a lot. Um, and we have some pretty good circumstantial evidence that if we could customize the CRT better for the individual patients, we could get much better outcomes. But there are just too many possibilities, too many different pacemaker lead locations, too many different settings for the pacemakers for us to do that by trial and error. And so we think that modeling has an important role to play here. Um, so here's an example of a patient with heart failure. On the left is a semi-MRI. Um, that heart is dilated and not contracting very well. On the right is dense MRI, which is a technique that allows us to actually track the displacement of the individual tissue voxels. Um, <coughs> 
there, although the amount of contraction is not what we'd like it to be, all the little arrows are sort of moving at the same time. So this is what I, we would call synchronous heart failure. Um, this patient will not benefit from CRT. CRT is intended to address the synchrony, and this patient doesn't have it. Um, so, so one of the advances is that we now know enough this patient will not get CRT. Um, so they screen patients using these dyssynchrony measures, um, and this patient would rule out and, and would, would get medical treatment. This patient, on the other hand, does have dyssynchrony. So you may be able to appreciate now on the right that there's sort of swirling of those yellow vectors. And everything's doing something at a different time. Um, and so this patient does have dyssynchrony um, and in theory should benefit from CRT. But if we use a standard CRT approach, um, about 60% of these patients will benefit, about 40% won't. And we don't know that the patients who do benefit even get the maximal benefit. Um, what's particularly problematic in a lot of these patients is in the lower um, left-hand side, um, this is a gadolinium uh, enhanced MRI, and there's a little white region down at the, at about, from about four o'clock to about six o'clock. That's a scar from a prior infarct. That's a big reason many of these patients end up in heart failure. And once you have scar, then it's a lot harder to figure out how to do the pacing appropriately. The idea of CRT is to put pacemaker leads in multiple locations and stimulate in order to force this heart to contract all at the same time instead of what it's doing right now. But part of this dyssynchrony is because of the scar. Um, and so you have to be able to take that into account. That varies from patient to patient. Um, and so the overall modeling framework that, that we're using reflects not only that complexity, but also the fact that what we really want to predict is not what happens in the first hour after we put the pacemaker in. What we really want to predict is what the patient's going to look like at six months follow-up. That's what the clinicians are interested in. That's what the patient is interested in. And that means predicting not only the mechanics, but the growth and remodeling. And so in the center of this diagram, you see a final element model of the left ventricle, um, actually of the entire heart. Um, this is in continuity, the, the software that the UCSD group um, has developed. At the systems level, going up a scale, it's coupled to a fairly simple model of the circulation because that determines a, a lot of the loading conditions for the heart. Um, then going down in scale, we're representing um, both the, the myocardium, the remaining muscle uh, on the top in red there, and then the scar tissue um, I'll, I'll tell you why we're doing that. That's resulting from the myocardial infarction. Um, and then at the cell level, uh, as I'll show you in a second, um, for the scar, we're actually representing all the individual cells. And for the myocytes, we're representing the behavior of the myocytes and validating against myocytes, but we're doing it at, at more of a continuum level. Um, so I think you saw this slide already once today. Um, for, the, for the scar, we've developed some agent-based models of scar formation um, that, uh, <coughs> that show um, incorrectly on this monitor, sorry, that show the cells migrating in and depositing um, collagen, the color code uh, there with lighter colors, the yellows and oranges being um, more dense collagen. And in particular, um, we've used this to look at the determinants of collagen alignment, which is important for the tissue properties. Um, and uh, we've, we've explored a number of factors, but one of the key ones that determines that collagen structure in the scar is the mechanical environment, which means when we start pacing and changing the mechanics, we expect the scar to remodel. We also expect the myocardium to remodel. And to um, predict that, we're using a class of models called phenomenologic growth models. Um, the equations look like this. You don't have to look at that if you don't want to. But since it's a room full of models, I thought you might. Um, the standard approach with these types of models it is to assume that growth is being driven by, some, by the difference between some mechanical stimulus and its normal physiologic set point. Um, th this particular one was published by Anders Group in 2012, and in our opinion, it's the, it's the best one so far in terms of being able to capture the most experiments that we know how to do to a heart with a single set of growth equations. Um, and on the right hand, they're showing that they're predicting the right trend for the kinds of experiments that we typically do to induce hypertrophy to, to a heart, um, such as creating valve lesions that then trigger growth and predicting the amount of growth that we see. Um, this particular model has also already been validated to predict the asymmetric hypertrophy that you see when you have electrical dyssynchrony, which makes it particularly useful for our purposes. Um, and just as an aside about the, multi, the importance of multi-scale, the little green line with the open signals down at the, the open symbols down at the bottom, uh, obviously the blue is data um, from, from asynchronous hypertrophy or asymmetric hypertrophy. The green is the model prediction, but the little open symbols are what the model looked like before it was coupled to a circulation and the circulatory changes were taken into account. So clearly it's not enough to just focus at the ventricular or ventricular and tissue level. It has to be coupled to a circulation in order to reproduce the data. So um, 
the aims of the grant are actually linked from, um, from the agenda the, in the grant abstract. So I thought instead I would just mention a couple of what I think are interesting problems that we're working on. Each one of these has a poster here. Um, the first one is just the general idea that we build all these growth models by doing things that make the, make the heart grow. But what we're interested in clinically is taking a heart that has already been growing for years and years and making it go backwards, right? We want to reverse the dilation in the case of heart failure. And so it's not obviously clear that any of the stuff that we did for forward remodeling is going to work the same for reverse remodeling, especially because our starting point is a remodeled state where we don't know the whole history, right? Um, and so we'll skip some of this text and I'll just show you as a, as a very simple example. Um, on the left-hand side, again, pressure volume loops for those of you heart people. Um, the black one is the baseline loop. The blue solid is after imposing a simulated um, aortic stenosis. This is simulating an experiment that someone did in dogs. Um, we let it grow and remodel for a while. Then we have the dotted dark blue loop. And then we set the circulatory parameters all the way back to their baseline. So we restored the loading to exactly the baseline state. And now we have the cyan loop. So the fact that we have growth means that even under the same loading conditions, the mechanics of this heart are not the same, and so you don't expect it then to behave the same in terms of the growth laws, and we're thinking about how to account for that. So Kyoko Yoshida is a postdoc in the group, and she has a, a poster um, on this if you'd like to hear more about that. A little more of a technical problem that we've been working on in collaboration with Shane Pierce, who taught my lab about agent-based modeling, is thinking about coupling the agent-based models to the finite element models. Um, for this particular purpose. And so, so in general here, the question is one of spatial scaling. The agent-based models that we're running are representing behaviors like cell migration. So we usually run them on um, grids that have spacing on the order of a couple of microns. Um, but with finite element models, you're doing things at a continuum level, and so usually the elements are substantially bigger. Um, that in itself might not be um, so tricky, but the coordinate systems are also different, in particular when we're modeling a heart and in the continuity software, um, we happen to be using higher order on an element uh, model, so, cu so cubic elements um, that are curved because the heart's curved. And so the mapping between the two um, systems gets a little interesting. Um, the short version is that either you pick a regularly spaced ABM grid, you map it into the finite element, and you get non-uniformly spaced points. Um, and that's okay, but it gets computationally expensive with nonlinear elements. Um, the other choice is you pick a grid of points in the finite element, and you map it to the ABM space. That works fine, too. In general, though, then the ABM points are non-uniformly spaced. So as you solve problems like cell migration and diffusion, you have to account for that. Either one is a viable way to go. There are computational trade-offs, and we're spending some time thinking about what are the relative um, benefits and um, limitations for some of the different problems that we and others might be interested in. Um, so, so JJ Lee is an, another postdoc in the group, has a poster on that. If you'd like to talk to see a little bit more about that or talk to JJ. Uh, and then in terms of acknowledgments, uh, the red, folks highlighted in red, I mentioned JJ and Kyoko are folks in the group, either uh, current or recent grads who have worked on this project. Um, some funding, Andrew and Jeff and Amir Naku is the postdoc in their group at UCSD. And then a, a slight plug, I have flyers if you would like one, and Jeff Wasserman is carrying some around, as are my postdocs. We have multiple open postdoc positions, both in San Diego and the EVA right now for any students you might have who are interested in heart modeling. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next up is Dr. David DeSanta and Connor Lynch and their project. hoping that this is going to work because uh, this is not my presentation file. It's a PDF file, so um, the animations might look a bit funny. Uh, but we all have imagination, right? Uh, so my name is David Basanta, and I'm with the Integrated Mathematical Oncology Department. Uh, Connor Lynch, who is in the audience, if you have any criticism about the biology I'll be presenting today, is with the Timor Biology Department. We're both at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we're really happy to be here, uh, although the weather maybe is a bit a different topic. But uh, thanks, Grace, for, for uh, making this possible. Um, what's going on? There you go. So, yeah. Uh, we've been working for a few years, so 
last few years on prostate cancer to bone metastasis. Now, that's a very important kind of cancer. It's depending on what rankings you take a look at, it's second or third largest cause of death in cancer in the United States and other developed countries. It's also uh, obviously um, important for impacts potentially um, about 50% of the world's population and given the audience in this conference, probably more than 50%. And one of the reasons why cancer is such a difficult uh, disease to treat is cancer is actually an evolutionary disease. And this is something that uh, a lot of values entertain as a hypothesis, but it's only the um, uh, coming out of this paper by uh, Marco Carmenger and uh, Charlie Swanson in London a few years back that actually sort of uh, unleashed uh, no, lots of new research on, on the idea that cancer is actually something that is driven is consistent with the winning evolutionary uh, uh, processes and is a highly heterogeneous disease. And actually this is a very cool picture because it tries to mimic a bit the tree of life in Darwin's book, The Origin of Life. And uh, this is interesting to me in, in a couple of respects. One of them is obviously that it sort of highlights how evolution-like cancer is. Also it sort of puts the emphasis on uh, the phylogenetics here. So mutations obviously drive cancer, but we believe that that's not the only thing driving cancer. I think that um, mutations are just part of the equation that explains evolution. The other one is selection. And in order to understand selection, we need to uh, define the ecosystem in which bones uh, invade, grow, and take advantage of. Now, um, this is a multi-scale ecosystem, and uh, we're basically doing a number of things in order to better characterize it. But trying to understand where cancers grow, how cancer interacts with other cells in the environment, with uh, molecules, with other cell types, with a physical microenvironment, is something that needs to be understood better if we're going to basically understand cancer and find new ways to treat the disease. So in order to do that, uh, we recruited these two um, young scientists, uh, Arturo Araujo and Nia Ku, who are the postdocs that have been working on this project. Arturo is a mathematician, or a mathematical modeler, and Nia is the experimentalist, which you can tell because this one in lab coat. And uh, I'm happy to report that uh, this research has been published, but also um, the research I'm going to be presenting today is also in the posters that uh, you can sort of stop by and ask us any questions either later on today, tomorrow, or Friday. And um, given um, that nature, we created a, a mathematical multi-scale model that is actually incorporating both cell types and, let me see if I go, no, yeah. And that's the, the nature of the animation you'll find here. You have to scroll another one and then you see uh, all the information. So there is obviously a, a cellular scale and there's a molecular scale. And we try to capture all the relevant agents at uh, both scales that might actually be important in driving uh, how the bone works. Uh, and this is going to be something that I'll spend some time studying. And finally as well, uh, how tumors come in and actually change the whole landscape. So in a multi-scale model, uh, we have the cell scale model in a different way that we model the uh, molecular scale. The cell scale is, is an, being an AM-based model uh, described better in terms of this flowchart rule-based system that uh, sort of applies to all the five cell types that we have incorporated into the model. And there's a molecular scale that is described by these uh, partial differential equations that describe both key signals that are exchanged between the cells in normal context, but also in the cancerous context, like TGF beta, uh, rank ligands, and also other uh, bone derived factors that are basically released uh, in the process of bone homostasis and bone remodeling. And the beauty of actually being in, in, in this integrated approach uh, by which we have both models and experimentalists is that as there is a lot that we know about how bones work, how dynamic the bone is, and the cell types are involved in, in keeping the bone healthy. We also have a lot of data that we don't know, so we actually had uh, Leah and, and, and Connor do an experience for us in order to find key parameters, for instance, uh, how different molecules secreted by tumor cells impact different aspects of the um, stromal cell component in, in the bone. So regular bone cells in a healthy environment will be impacted by this TG data. And um, this is basically how the model works. And, and uh, at this stage, if you look at the, the lab, which is the only information you find right now, there is only um, normal cells, healthy cells. There is no tumor over here. And you see in a sequence of time how the cells come in and play a big role in, in bone homostasis. That is, 
destroying a bond that needs to be removed and then coming in and actually uh, rebuilding the bond in order to make it stronger and, and, and treatable. So in day zero, um, you can see that there is, um, uh, on the bottom part of the simulation is uh, the bone. Uh, there's a little canopy which is raised, and there are good pixels that present the different cell types. Um, see if there's release, which is this cloud, orange cloud uh, and, and, and day zero. Uh, on day two, bone, uh, chemo, sorry, cells are recruited, which are precursor osteoclasts, cells that will come and destroy the cell. In day eight, you can see how these cells are really actively destroying the cell and releasing a number of factors that simulate the proliferation of certain cells that come later on, on day um, 100, and start building bones. So basically, uh, if you wait long enough, uh, this, this process uh, will, will release um, a number of factors will be uh, orchestrated by factors released and produced by the different cell types, and naturally result in the emergence of bone remodeling and bone homostasis. And if you add tumor cells into the equation, in many cases, this is what you find, which is that the whole process starts looking quite normal, but if you wait long enough, you find that there's a lot of more cells coming in and being recruited by the different factors that have now been changed in terms of balance because of this tumor cell that start basically changing the balance at a point that there's a lot more bone remodeling going on. There's a lot more cells uh, being basically uh, produced and, and uh, put to apoptose, and there's a lot more bone remodeling which helps the tumor grow, which obviously you can see clearly on, on day 200 of the, of the right side of this uh, slide. Having a model like this basically means that we can only understand how uh, the bone is supposed to work, but how bone is, is uh, homocysteine disrupted, and how treatments can potentially change that. So these are all treatments that are applied normally in the clinic. Nothing very special about phosphonates. They, they won't work, and we know that they don't work in the clinic. Now we know a bit more about why they don't work. And the random ligands, which disrupt the process of recruitment of cells to destroy the bone, um, have a huge impact if we assume that they're incredibly effective, but if you reduce the effectiveness uh, of, of your treatment, you see that you need to have a huge amount of efficacy of that drug in order to make them work. So yes, at least with this information, you can tell that some treatments will have absolutely no way of working, whereas other treatments, if you sort of have uh, optimistic delivery and um, a good uh, amount of success with, with how effective they are, they'll have an impact potentially in, in the patient. We could also try new treatments, treatments, for instance, that uh, target molecules that have not been conventionally targeted in the clinic. And, and the model allows us not only to basically find out whether they work or not, but what the timing would be. And this is something that Colonel Lynch and, and Lee have made sure that we uh, experimentally validate. With this new U1 grant, what we're trying to do is further refine this bone ecosystem by including new molecules and new cell types, including macrophages, which are part of the innate immune system, to try to figure out how this would impact the whole process and how we can find even more ways to potentially disrupt the process by which uh, the metastasis goes. And then again, just imagine that this is a movie, yes, and I'll take the whole space. It looks very pretty, uh, very seamless. But we have a very complex thing. This is not going to be the model. This is just going to be what we have spent. We spent a lot of time sifting through literature, trying to find out all the relevant molecules, all the relevant interactions, and, and how these interactions impact positive or negatively the different cell types and molecules that we think are important. We have started with a very simple model that would allow us to basically understand these macrophages and how these macrophages' phenotypic plasticity might impact how the tumors progress but we have done a lot of work in order to understand how we can change the model to make it richer and, and more able to sort of make precision um, predictions about uh, the progression of the disease. We have some provisional results, and I'd like to highlight that this is a very model-driven approach. We like to use mathematics as a way to incorporate multi-scale, multi-level data that comes from the biological experiment, but also from clinical data that can be fed back into the laboratory and fit into the mathematical model, a model uh, that could make predictions in order to personalize treatments for specific patients in clinic. That's one of the advantages of Bain and Moffitt. We have already partnered with uh, clinicians like Dr. Krieger Paustan, which is a chief surgeon, um, an oncologist, and epidemiologist at Moffitt, in order to make sure that what all groups do can actually have clinical transferability. And uh, at this stage, I'd like to thank everyone involved for the team. And finally, um, just a quick plug. Thank you very much.
Thank you, David. Thank you. Next, next up is Dr. Sylvia Bumfer and Shane Pierce Cutler on their project. Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here to share with you our new project on multi-scale modeling in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So um, I'm Sylvia Blemker and my co-PI is Shane Pierce Cotler and who's in the room as well. And we're from the University of Virginia. We're compelled by a pretty devastating disease called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So just a little bit about it so you understand the biology and clinical problem that we're interested in. Um, uh, and it's also a really compel compelling multi-scale problem. So um, we're looking at muscle here, and if you look within the muscle, it has this hierarchical structure um, going from, I always I should practice the pointer before I start. Oops, that's not it. Is it a pointer? Oh, awesome, thank you. I'll use the mouse, all right, I'll use the mouse. Um, so uh, this is a whole muscle and we're looking at there's fascicles and within them the little red things are fibers. If you pull them out, um, what we're interested in is, uh, is dystrophin, which is localized at the fiber membrane. So dystrophin connects the contractile proteins within the muscle uh, through the dystro dystroglycan complex at the fiber membrane to the extracellular matrix. So the absence of this dystrophin protein is what leads to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So that one protein is gone, and what happens is uh, babies are, it's a genetic disorder affecting about one in 3,500 males. Um, so it's a, um, a mutation in the gene that encodes for dystrophin. Boys are born, uh, at first you wouldn't know that they have the disease. If you look at uh, biopsies of their muscle, they look relatively healthy. Unless you specifically labeled for dystrophin, you, know, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't know that anything was wrong. But was, over time, as the boys start moving and walking, you start seeing some weakness. So uh, around three to five years of age, you start to detect changes in their walking. They have difficulty standing up. Um, and then at six to eight, it's very noticeable. Um, they get a lot of fatigue. It's hard for them to walk around. By the time they're in uh, their uh, early teens, they're in a wheelchair. Um, and so here, what we're looking at the kind of the effect of the disease at, at all scales. At the um, high scale, we can see that um, we're affecting the ability for these uh, children to move. At the tissue scale, we're seeing very much changes in the, in the histology and the um, pathology of the muscle. Over time, we go from a healthy looking muscle, all muscle fibers, to uh, muscle fibers. We got a lot of um, fibrosis, um, necrotic fibers, um, inflammation, and over time we have uh, almost full replacement from muscle to either fat infiltration or fibrosis, and that's why they can't move. And sadly enough, ultimately these children, um, uh, they can now live to their mid-20s about, but ultimately pass away from respiratory failure or cardiac failure, but um, a lot of that's to do with, um, with a, a lack of ability of their breathing muscle. So it's a really sad, um, sad disease. The other part of it that's really frustrating to scientists in the field, as well as um, the many parent advocacy groups, is that there's um, been an established mouse model of this disease for multiple decades. It's called the MDX mouse, and now there's multiple variants of that. The MDX is very, it's genetically uh, similar to the mouse human condition, but phenotypically it's not as strong, so people have developed mul multiple iterations of that to make it more phenotypically similar. And what's frustrating is that it doesn't replicate it, but most frustrating is that that mouse has been cured many, many, many times, but none of those cures have translated to the human. So right now there are no effective treatments for this. There was the first FDA approval, um, preliminary approval of a drug for DMD, um, but there's no um, observed clinical benefit. So parents and families are, are um, and kids are signing up for this drug that um, actually has no um, proved clinical benefit. It, so it's, it's very frustrating. Um, and so we're compelled by this problem. Uh, really the, the reason why we think, and many I think agree, the reason why it's such a challenging problem, to, especially translation from mouse to human, is that there's lots of um, hypothesized mechanisms that contribute to the pathophysiology of the disease. There's a lot of going on. This dystrophin protein does a lot and it results in a lot of things that change over time. 
So the simplest thing is it's thought that this, um, uh, the because this uh, dystrophin protein is localized at the fiber membrane, it has a mechanical function where it protects the muscle from damage uh, to regular contra uh, contractions. So it's thought that, um, and, it's, and it's seen that dystrophic muscles are ex extremely susceptible to damage from regular contractions that for us would be fine, but a dystrophic muscle. So it gets damaged very, um, very uh, easily. So that's a mechanical uh, function. But then over time, as the muscles get damaged, you end up with a state of chronic inflammation, elevated states of uh, um, uh, levels of macrophages and various other inflammatory markers. But then we also end up with a profibrotic state. These uh, muscles end up becoming fibrotic, and that um, perpetuates. Uh, and then also, dystrophin has a role in the um, satellite stem cell dynamics. So the stem, stem cells that are um, important for regeneration following injury, it turns out that dystrophin has a role in, that, in those cell dynamics as well. So that's a lot of things. And actually, I haven't, there's other uh, also signaling mechanisms for this protein. So there's a lot going on. Um, and while the field has agreed that each, we have several studies that isolate each of these things and develop targets that shown in the mouse that you, you attack each of these targets, something happens, that doesn't really translate to human because we don't understand how all these mechanisms interact with each other. Um, and so that's really what we're compelled by is we think that's ultimately one of the um, key contributions of a con computational model is that we can put all that stuff in the computer. We can integrate all of these known mechanisms and understand how they interact and result in disease progression and how they might be leveraged to, to develop novel therapies. So our, UA, our UO1 grant aims to address this with multi-scale modeling. So I've broken down our aims here. Uh, our first aim is to develop and, and validate a model of the a muscle degeneration in dystrophic mouse muscles. So we, um, we started with the mouse model, albeit it doesn't translate well to humans, but there's tons of data on, especially the MDX mouse model, so it's a really wealth of information. It's an established model. It's what the field uses. So if we want to really, um, you know, start where the field is, we, we need to base um, our model from that first. So we're developing that model um, based on, on, on experiments in the literature, but also we're designing, we have, we're developing our own uh, colony of, of um, MDX um, mice, and we're doing some of our own experiments. Uh, then we're using that model to do some preclinical trials to sort of see how the model predicts um, either already tested or te um, uh, preclinical tests that we're going to do in the lab to see if our model is predictive of what you see in, in particular in the mouse. And then thirdly, uh, we want to extend this model to the human. Um, interestingly, I'll tell you the anecdote. One of our collaborators um, is a guy named Kevin Campbell who's at University of Iowa. He's a really well-known um, established investigator in muscular dystrophy, and he's the one that really um, helped us realize that this translation to human is really the where, where the most important problem is. We found that in the field. So um, we, uh, our modeling framework goes like this. We're starting with whole uh, muscle simulations um, uh, because it's, we have to simulate the contraction and the mechanics. Uh, then we dive, we use those macroscale strains to inform micro, micromechanical simulations that simulate what's going on in the microscale, in particular the role of dystrophin that links the fibers that are in blue here with the ECM, which is in the coloring, which is right now undergoing a lot of shear stress and strain in the simulation. And then we're linking that with agent-based simulations that predict the response from that particular mechanical um, input. I, uh, for example, an injury, we can predict the resulting uh, degeneration, regeneration profile. That now we're going to observe changes in microstructure, which updates our micromechanical simulations, and those back update the tissue and muscle properties at the whole scale. Um, ultimately, what we're aiming to, to predict with this is over time, this, both the microscale and macroscale remodeling the muscle, which, is, which are both things that we can observe experimentally to test our, our predictions. So a couple of uh, um, uh, snippets of what we're doing. So here's an example of a, a finite out model of the mouse diaphragm that we've developed. Uh, we're simulating contraction during breathing and looking at uh, fiber strains within the, within the uh, muscle. And we're also doing a dynamic MRI of tracking pixels. The video is not working, but uh, similar to what Jeff Holmes showed, but this is of the diaphragm ruminating in the, in the mouse. Uh, the micromechanical simulations are, are based on um, a, a, a number of papers that we developed on how to um, extract the tissue level properties from uh, models of the microstructure of muscle and uh, using homogenization theory so we can um, now also model the uh, effects of the dystrophin links and do things like affecting the number and properties of dystrophin because some of the targets are related to that. And then we're doing some biaxial testing to test um, those predictions. 
in different um, uh, mouse or tissue models. And then finally, our agent-based model is uh, essentially once we know the damage within the muscle from the injury, we can predict what happens. So this is an agent-based simulation that captures muscle fibers, ECM, um, necrosis damage, but all of the, the key cell players within the muscle, the fibroblasts, the myocytes, uh, the satellite stem cells, the, um, and the um, various uh, inflammatory cells are all included in this model to predict regeneration and degeneration. So we can replicate, we've replicated in, um, injury and regeneration um, based on comparison with literature. So we're looking at here prediction of recovery from injury um, following um, uh, eccentric contraction uh, uh, simulated in the model, and then we've compared it with uh, experiments. Um, then we can do this in multiple stages of disease. Um, but, uh, um, and here's an example of where we've done some preliminary simulations of anti-inflammatory therapy, which is one of the current hot topics, and look at how that may affect the time course of recovery from injury. So we're looking at and how that's different across stages of disease. And then um, the, uh, one other for um, AIM-3, one thing that we've been looking at um, we're, in terms of mouse demand differences, we're doing across the scales from large biomechanical to effects of different inflammatory profiles. This is an example of looking at the muscle fiber behavior in human gait versus mouse gait. So uh, mice are blue, humans are red, and what we can see very clearly is that muscles are used very differently between the mouse and the human, which may play a, a big role in why a mouse muscle may be um, ultimately damaged differently than the human. So ultimately, um, we're integrating a lot of different data types for mouse and human and across scales. Um, so one of our challenges is integrating that all. And we're using this for validation. We have a talk on model credibility at the end of the, um, at the, end of the uh, on Friday, where we'll talk a little bit more about our validation uh, uh, procedures. So we'd like to thank um, our two labs are collaborating uh, here and the multiple students who've been involved in the project, as well as our collaborators at UVA and um, outside of UVA. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And our last talk is um, on the project led by Michael Henson, Eric Herzog, and Giannis Kavertidis. Yes, okay. Um, okay. So, uh, Mike Henson, I'm from the University of Massachusetts. Um, my co-PIs in this project are Eric Herzog. I'm a bioengineer modeler, let's say. Eric Herzog is a circadian biologist at Washington University, and Yanis Kevrakidis is also a chemical engineer, but he's, uh, most of his work is kind of advanced computation and model reduction techniques. So the problem we're working on is in the domain of circadian rhythm generation, and we are particularly interested in developing multi-scale models that, that allow us to understand how this really complex system network neurons work. So I will um, give you some overview of that. But there we go. Uh, there we go. All right, so just give you a little background on the circadian clock. Um, so what I'm talking about is the core clock that's in your brain stem, the uh, hypothalamus, the so-called suprachiasmatic nucleus, that drives all the rhythms in your body that allows you to do things like get up at the same time, eat at the same time, work, sleep, and all the things that you need to have uh, normal physiological function. And this particular system that I'll talk about in the next slide is really not a system that's driven by an individual neuron, but a very large collection of neurons. And um, it, the robustness of the system it emerges from the, from the network behavior, not from the individual cell behavior. So it's very important to study the network. The problem we're particularly interested in this particular project is shift work. So this is a typical shift schedule. Um, where someone, uh, one team might work two days in a row at 7 in the morning and then uh, next two days at 3 in the afternoon and finally two days at 11 o'clock at night and then two days off. And this can repeat kind of an infinitum. And this is um, a problem because your clock, your internal clock cannot shift this much, cannot shift eight hours every two days. So these people have a chronic misalignment between the, their clock and the environment in which they're working. So this is where the system is located. So this is uh, the, in the hypothalamus um, in mammals. So this is a collection of two hemispheres, about 10,000 neurons each. Um, so 20,000 uh, individual neurons. Um, they produce 24-hour rhythms, but if you look at any individual neuron, they're actually a very poor timekeeper. So some neurons are rhythmic, some are not. Some have 21-hour um, rhythms, some have 29. So it's really the collective behavior of the system that allows it to function. And so one of the things that we're trying to understand, or one of our main interests in this project, and has been actually for almost a decade, 
is trying to understand how these, uh, how these neurons uh, coordinate their behavior and um, how they generate these rhythms. And actually, the behavior of the individual neurons is pretty well understood, why individual neurons have rhythmicity, but not how they actually coordinate. So this is just a simple picture taken from a review paper on the feedback loops. It's actually a complex set of um, intertwined feedback, a negative and positive feedback loops. But this is at the transcriptional, translational level. Um, there's a lot of players in terms of proteins and genes, but this is largely understood. So people understand how the system works. And this is also coupled to the um, physiology or the electrophysiology of the cell. So you have both gene regulation, you have electrophysiology, and you also have signaling, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and this, the individual pacemakers, the individual neurons, their behavior is pretty well characterized. Um, What's not understood is how these cells communicate to generate a rhythm, and that's what we're studying. So these are the two main players, or thought to be two of the main players in terms of coordinating behavior between neurons. The first one is called BIP. Um, this is a signaling cascade. Basically, one neuron can secrete BIP that will eventually affect the transcription of a gene in the, in the target cell, and it'll basically be, be able to phase shift that cell. And this has been shown over the last decade to be essential. Okay. So if we want these individual neurons to synchronize, to coordinate their behavior, this neurotransmitter is essential and is generally understood to be so. On the other hand, GABA, which is very um, prevalent in the brain, acts through a different mechanism, actually uh, acts through the phys electrophysiology of the cell and inhibits neural firing. And its role in synchronization is very poorly understood. And I would say you can find papers that say it does everything has no effect, has a positive effect during the day, a negative effect at night. So no one seems to understand the role of GABA, and that's one of the things we hope to unravel in this project. So here are the aims. Um, so the first one, so this model involves, uh, this project involves three components. There's an experimental component, there's a multi-scale modeling component, and then there's a, a kind of a multi-scale simulation component, if you will, some advanced model reduction and simulation. So the first way, uh, thing involves blocking this particular neurotransmitter and enhancing it in in vitro experiments where we take neurons out of the mice and also coordinating those experiments with a multi-scale simulation, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, second one, it involves um, looking at the role, the dual role of this two neurotransmitters, which is GABA and BIP in coordination. And then finally, we want to develop a, kind of a proof of concept of how you could use a multi-scale model like this. So these benzodiazepine drugs are drugs that you would give someone to help kind of shift their clock. So this basically inhibits, um, their GABA signaling inhibits brain activity, it tries to get people to relax so they can sleep. And so what's not known very well is um, when you should apply these sleep medications. So we, we want to develop a model-based strategy that would allow us to determine what's the optimal time and, and amount of the drug to take in order to um, shift the clock and then to, to actually test these in in vivo experiments with mice. So I'll just go through this quickly, since we're a little behind schedule. So this is the next three slides on the experimental progress in the project. This project's only been active for six months, so we don't have like years to report of activity to report. So what Eric has done in his lab at Washington University is, is implemented optogenetic techniques. Actually, the proposal had a little different techniques, but these are much better. Um, this allows him to control the firing of individual neurons. So you can actually make neurons fire at different frequencies this just shows the stimulus and the actual firing frequency, and these, this is a control, and this is a genetically engineered cell. So we can take neurons and make them fire at whatever rate, not just any neuron, we can target specific neurons. So for example, not all the neurons produce VIP, so we can just target the neurons that do um, secrete VIP, regulate their firing, and see what the effect will be. So that's very exciting. Eric has some preliminary results here showing that um, it's not just the firing uh, frequency that matters or the stimulus, it's how often you apply the stimulus. So this is uh, an uh, experiment where you have two cells. You have one with the engineered um, cell, one with the control. You apply a stimulus. And in this case, these, this, it's the same total amount of uh, pulses, but these pulses are very rapid. And these pulses, in this case, are, are applied more in a tonic fashion, a lot less frequently. And you can see if they're applied in a bursting fashion, you get much more shifting of the neurons. So we're looking at how it shifts away from the control, and you can see there's a big phase shift here and almost no effect here. 
So it's not just a matter of just applying the um, stimulus, it's also a matter of um, how you apply it. I think I'll skip this. This basically shows the, the same, same thing. All right. So what we want to do now is, is take advantage of our multi-scale modeling framework that we've been developing over the last few years. And so what this involves is a, a model of an individual neuron. So this is uh, our neuron model. It includes the core clock here, which is the gene regulatory circuit, also the signaling in terms of calcium and CREB, and also the electrophysiology and the relevant currents. So that's a model of an individual neuron. Then we allow these individual neurons to communicate um, through different transmitters, so in our project namely, uh, mainly VIP and also GABA, which isn't actually shown here. And then a typical simulation, we would put about uh, 400 of these on a two-dimensional grid. Um, you establish a coupling between, some coupling network between the individual neurons, and then you can perform simulations. And for example, we've done simulations that, this is a typical simulation showing the firing rates. This is the trace of about 400 simulated neurons as a function of time. We, we do the simulations with the, with the uh, individual neurons being very heterogeneous in terms of their um, period. So not all neurons are the same, that's why you don't get perfect synchrony. In this case, we wanted to study this effect of GABA. So it's been accepted for a long time that GABA is just an um, inhibitory neurotransmitter. But more recently in the SBN, it's been shown that it could be potentially um, excitatory. And so we wanted to explore this with our model. So you can do this by manipulating the electrophysiology by changing the mean chloride concentration. And then you can change what was an in, in, inhibitory relationship to excitatory. So now instead of get one GABA cell inhibiting another, it can actually excite another. And then if you look at this, so this is the same axis here. If you look at the synchronization index is a measure of how well the cells are synchronized. One is perfect synchrony, zero is perfect asynchrony. So you can see when a GABA signaling goes from inhibitory to excitatory, there's a big drop in the synchronization of the cell. So we are, one of the things we want to explore in this particular project is that GABA actually counteracts VIP. So VIP synchronizes the cell, which is great because you want to synchronize populations of neurons. But if you go into a new environment and need the clock to shift, then you don't want the cells to be tightly synchronized because if they are, they shift very slowly to like jet lag or shift work. So one theory is the GABA is actually, it's a push-pull kind of mechanism where GABA actually inhibits um, the effect of VIP. And the kind of simulations that we're doing um, are reasonably time, intense, uh, time and computational intensive. So each neuron uh, on the order of 20 differential equations. We'd like to be able to do thousands of these over a large number of different network topologies because the network topology is not something we know very well. So we'd like to see what the effect of network topology is on the behavior of the system. And so to do that, we, um, are, we approached um, Yanis Kebrakidi's group at Princeton, and they were actually working on this exact problem, which was very <laughs> convenient for us. And they use a method called um, uncertainty quantification. So this is um, basically a model reduction technique. It allows you basically to project very high order dynamics onto a lower order space. So you can do these kind of models much more efficiently. Um, Tom is here. I see him in the audience. Tom Birdland is, is Yanis' student. Yanis will be here Friday. We have a poster. So if anyone's interested in learning the details of this particular method, um, you can certainly chat about it. But the idea is we, we use this method of uncertainty quantification, but in terms of assuming the parameters uncertain, we assume they're heter heterogeneous. So in other words, they're not that we don't know them, it's just they're not the same for every cell type. Um, and then you can actually use this to develop methods to do projection of the dynamics onto a lower order space which is shown in this picture. So this is slightly different than our problem, although I know they've done uh, done this with our neurons as well. So these are some simple Hodgkin-Huxley type neurons with a single ion channel. There's a, on the order of a thousand of these. They're heterogeneous in terms of the driving signal, which is applied current, and also in terms of a uh, 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 heterogeneous parameter of the network. This is my last slide. Um, so the neat thing about this approach, is it only, not only uh, deals with heterogeneous um, parameters in the individual neurons, but also network heterogeneity. Um, so this is a trace, um, so this is a simple model for illustration, so this is the voltage, this is an activation parameter over here, this is a trace over one cycle, and this shows you these low order dimensional spaces that they can extract using basis functions, using these, uh, this uncertainty quantification technique, that you can project the dynamics of all these neurons, and this is kind of like a flapping flag is the term they like to use. 
so we can develop, we can, we can reduce, you know, by, let's say, orders of magnitude, the dimensionality of the problem, and then we can do much more efficient simulation. Like I said, we'd be more happy to talk to you about that. So I think that's probably enough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. And that concludes our new UO1 awardee session. So thank you all for today. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock.